to all God's beloved in Oakwood, <laughs> who are called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I bring you greetings from our bishop, Robert Wright, on whose staff I serve as missioner for engagement and innovation. I bring you greetings from your more than 50,000 sisters and brothers in the Diocese of Atlanta, spread across 75 and a half counties, <laughs> and meeting for worship today in 109 places, including this one. Thanks be to God. I also bring you greetings from the world's busiest airport, where I serve <laughs> each week as your chaplain. Greetings from the more than 63,000 people who work there. And on a day like this, this close to Christmas, the more than 300,000 people who will pass through there this day. Wow. Greetings from all those folks. I spend time each week in the ministry context of the world's busiest airport as chaplain and as missioner for engagement and innovation. I travel the diocese, the diocese of Atlanta, the geographic diocese all over the place from Columbus to McDonough, from Perry to Blairsville, from LaGrange to Covington, from Crawfordville to Oakwood. Connecting people and ideas and resources, listening in on what is starting to take shape and what is already up and running. Protein pantries, freedom schools, alternatives to jail time, new kinds of theological education, innovations in healthcare, all kinds of good things that the Holy Spirit is inspiring and stirring up in Episcopalians across Middle and North Georgia are taking up. Bishop Wright and I have co-authored a book entitled The Go Guide. He says he's not sure if it's a book or a pamphlet on steroids, but in any case, <laughs> we have written it. It's 10 Steps for Innovations in Ministry from Luke chapter 10. It's the curriculum for what we are talking about when we talk about innovations in our diocese in this particular moment, our particular time. We hope it will help these innovations continue to propagate in various places around the diocese. We are being called into new things in the Diocese of Atlanta and the Episcopal Church, that's for sure. Some folks are reacting to this calling with anxiety over having to do new things or having to do old things in new ways. And others are responding with excitement to the opportunities presented to us in our current challenges. Humbled that God has seen fit to place us in now, where we are, when we are. How much does God trust us? to entrust to us the mission of reconciliation in our world, in this part of Middle and North Georgia, at this time. Wow. Along with people all over the Diocese of Atlanta, I am celebrating your faith and your willingness to take risks and experiment here at St. Gabriel's. I hope you already know, but in case you don't, I'm here to tell you, people all over the Diocese have read about what you are doing in Pathways, and they are taking heart so thank you for your leadership and your example in responding with excitement rather than reacting with fear and in anxiety. What you are daring to do here with God's help, we believe will be a model for many other congregations across our diocese. And I hope you are already dreaming about and listening for the next thing the Spirit is stirring up around here. Because the spirit is always stirring something up. <laughs> and it's my pleasure as preacher to get to stir stuff up also. So as we turn our attention to today's gospel, we read, Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Imagine Joseph's surprise. <laughs> His fiance has turned up pregnant, and he knows he's not the baby daddy. <laughs> at first, at the least, 
Joseph is unaware of the miraculous conception of Jesus. What must he have thought? Matthew's Gospel tells us Joseph was a righteous man. That doesn't mean he was self-righteous. That means he sought to live righteously, which is to say he sought to relate rightly to God and to other people. And being a righteous man, he tried to come up with a plan to reduce the likelihood of public disgrace and embarrassment. Certainly for Mary, but also, let's be honest, for himself. What would people say about him, an engaged man whose fiance has clearly been stepping out on him? <laughs> so this plan to just have the engagement annulled, and it would take an annulment because to be betrothed in this way was a legally binding contract on both parties. So to have this annulled and then to put Mary away we may understand, on the face of it, as a kind plan, something designed to spare them both embarrassment. But if Mary were to give birth to this baby without a husband, she would be in a profoundly disadvantageous situation, not only socially, but economically. For in the first century, as today, to be an unwed teenaged mother is to have pretty much a sure ticket, not only to social ostracization, but also to a particular kind of privation in life. Even so, Joseph makes this plan to dismiss Mary quietly and release her from their contract. Maybe he was mad about it. Maybe he was sad about it. Maybe he was relieved about it. Matthew doesn't say. But as soon as he had resolved to carry out this plan, an angel from God appeared to him in a dream. An angel of God. Angels are all over Advent and Christmas. They make solo and group appearances. They turn up to deliver messages and are sometimes named sometimes unnamed. The angel Gabriel, familiar name around here, appears to Mary and announces to her that she is blessed by God and will bear a son. Angels appear on the night of Jesus' birth. First, a single unnamed angel announces good news to some spirit shepherds on a hillside and then is joined by a great sky-filling, God-praising, peace-declaring chorus. Wow. And in between this annunciation to Mary and this declaration to the shepherds, an unnamed individual angel appears to Joseph in a dream. Do not be afraid. The first words of the angel to Joseph and the second words of the angel Gabriel to Mary. Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. Why is this the first thing or the second thing these angels say? Is it because then as now we humans harbor secret fears that messages from God will be bad news? Is it because we somehow think God's messages will be words of disappointment, dissatisfaction and disapproval, do not be afraid. Maybe angels have to say this first to clue humans into the fact that God is usually sending good news. Yes, angels all over Advent and Christmas, but what exactly are they? Have you ever wondered about this? I mean, it's a mixed report from Holy Scripture. We have all kinds of heavenly beings mentioned, these scary-sounding six-winged creatures in Isaiah's vision, and also seraphim, cherubim, which were mentioned in our psalm this morning, and so on. Some of our more philosophically-minded forebears in faith have expended great energy debating the size and features 
uh, angels and such very important and weighty topics as how many of them can dance at one time <laughs> on the head of a pen. <laughs> More recently, in our culture, all angels, regardless of what size or type, named or unnamed, have been turned into these sweet little cherubs, all sweetness and light all the time. And I don't know about you, but the angel Gabriel does not sound like that. <laughs> whatever angels may or may not be, and whatever qualities, shapes, and sizes they may or may not possess, this much is clear. When somebody has a visit from an angel in scripture, it means they have received a clear and direct message from God. Whatever Joseph may have felt or thought about the angel who came to him in a dream and about the message that angel delivered, when he woke up, he acted on this divine word and did it as the angel instructed. He married Mary, and he made sure the baby was named Jesus. What if Joseph hadn't paid attention to his dream? What if he sort of remembered it when he woke up the next morning and thought, well, that was weird. <laughs> and then went right ahead with his plan to annul his engagement to Mary. What if Joseph hadn't paid attention to his dream? To a divine messenger in the night. What if? We wouldn't be here, that's what if. <laughs> Can you imagine? We are here in this moment, in the 21st century, in this particular place, this specific gathering, because Joseph paid attention to his dream. We are here as members of the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement this morning, because a teenage girl named Mary said yes to a very strange mission delivered to her <coughs> by an angel. Does God still send clear, direct, personal messages through angels or in dreams? The more I travel around the Diocese of Atlanta, all over Middle and North Georgia, the more convinced I become that the Holy Spirit is visiting people all over the place and giving them dreams of new ways to live out their baptismal promises, new ways to be the church in the world. The more I talk with people all over Middle and North Georgia, the more convinced I become that God is still sending angels in various and often unlikely forms to help us see our circumstances in powerfully different and hopeful new ways to transform challenges into opportunities. God is still sending messages through angels and in dreams. And God is still sending the message, do not be afraid. This is the long awaited for good news. God loves the world. God is love. And God is with us and for us. Has God sent you a dream or an angel recently? Is there an idea you can't get out of your head no matter how hard you try? Is there some new thing that keeps you up at night pondering in a good way? Is that perhaps the next thing God is calling you and St. Gabriel's to do or be? Is it something you're afraid to say out loud to anybody else? Because you think, this is crazy. I have seen this happen enough times now to say, if you will be brave and say out loud to somebody else that you worship with here, what has been rolling around in your mind, 
you shouldn't be surprised if they say, I've been thinking the same thing. The Holy Spirit is always stirring stuff up. So would you be brave and share your maybe crazy, but perhaps transformative idea with somebody? Are you waiting for some kind of confirmation, some sort of sign that this thing that won't leave you alone is a God idea, not just a good idea? In our reading today from the Hebrew Scriptures, God, through the prophet Isaiah, invites Ahaz, king of Judah, to ask for a sign of God's presence, for a reassurance that God would deliver Ahaz and the people of Judah out of the conflict they were about to engage in. There was an alliance of other kings and nations that had gathered and were coming against Ahaz and the people of Judah. And Isaiah says, ask God for a sign that God will go with you, be with you, deliver you. This is the usual drill with prophets and leaders, usually kings. But Ahaz says, no, I will not ask, I will not put God to the test. That might sound really pious and faith-filled, but the sense of the passage is that Ahaz is copying out that his unwillingness to ask for reasonable reassurance demonstrates a lack of faith on his part. The usual drill is the king, usually, or the leader, at the invitation of the prophet, engages with God to make sure they are on the right course, to check in. And through the prophet Isaiah, God invites Ahaz to participate in this kind of divine dialogue. And Ahaz declines. And how often do we act like Ahaz? God invites us into relationship and sends numerous chances to engage in divine dialogue, to encounter people and situations that will revitalize our hopes and re-energize our dreams often opt out. Why is that? Maybe because we don't think we deserve grace. Maybe because even after lifetimes of hearing about it, we still think grace is for other people. And we somehow have to earn God's favor as if we ever could. Maybe because we have felt disappointed so often that we just don't have it in us to risk being hurt one more time. Ahaz won't engage, won't ask for a sign. But God sends one anyway. The prediction of the birth of a baby. And pregnancy and birth emerge as signs of God's favor, as tokens of God's love. And centuries later, the writer of Matthew's Gospel will identify the prediction in Isaiah of a baby who will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us, God for us, as a prediction of the birth of the baby Jesus. We are here today because Joseph paid attention to his dreams and Mary listened to the message delivered by an angel. And since we are here, we must be here for a purpose. That purpose is to love like Jesus. Because God has a mission. And that mission has a church. And we are it. Just like that baby born long ago, we are called into, not out of, this broken beautiful world. God still has stuff for us to do, y'all. So lift up your hearts and lace up your boots. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thus, affirm my 